All right, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About Horror with your boy Walter Doom on the mic. And we have an exciting episode for you guys today. I am going to be talking about the Winnie the Pooh sequel. And I am going to be talking about Goldilocks and the Three Bears. What is up with that? And I also have a Slasher Corner movie for you guys to check out this week for our last week of Black History Month. Can't believe it's already gone that gone that fast already, <laughs> honestly. But anyway, thank you to Kelly the Wolf and Algorithm C for supplying the beats to the show. And if you want to follow your boy on them social medias, them social medias are Walter Doom Horror on IG, on TikTok, on YouTube, and Walter Doom wherever podcasts are streaming. So let's go ahead and get into the show. start off with the lead story of today so as a lot of us know right now Winnie the Pooh is a public domain that has been turned into a horror movie no longer owned by Disney um, now anybody could do whatever the fuck they want with those characters and last year Rise Frock um, Water Waterfill I believe the, the name is <laughs> I swear I did an episode about this motherfucker last time as one of the directors for for scream but yeah rice frock waterfield did a horror movie of winnie the pooh and it taught and they titled it winnie the pooh blood and honey major success the movie was budgeted off uh, i believe 100k and the movie came out with six million out of the box office budget overall so with that success as a lot of fucking horror movies like to do or just like franchises in general they always want to go with a sequel. So, Blade Disgusting came out with an article and it is talking about the trailer of Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey, which is also a trailer that came out. I did actually watch the trailer, but I'm gonna read you guys the story. So, last year's viral hit Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey is getting a sequel this year and Jagged Edge production okay let me stop <laughs> i don't know why the first thing i thought about was jagged edge music you know <laughs> if you know you know but anyway um and jagged edge productions has released the film's bloody official trailer this morning the team has promised that returning director rise frog waterfields winning the poop blood and honey 2 will be bigger better and bloodier than the first film with a higher budget allowing for both brand new creature designs and a higher kill count so if you guys don't know last year they couldn't even use the character tigger because he was still in the public domain well not the public domain but he was still under the copyright laws with disney so because of that they couldn't really use that character and there was like a few other characters that they couldn't even use because those characters didn't come till later on during the series of winnie the pooh when it was like you know back in the days but whatever whatever i don't really watch winnie the pooh like that but according to like um different reports that i've read and just like them talking about this whole winnie the pooh situation that's the reason why they didn't get a chance to use Tigger and whatever other characters that we all 
know and beloved or for those that love and below winning the pooh like that frockwater phil had teased the upcoming sequel last year this time pooh and friends will be leaving the hundred acre wood to take their fight to the quiet community of ashdown the sequel will feature winnie the pooh christopher robin piglet owl and tigger i feel like didn't piglet get killed in blood and honey i know they they got to him and they managed to take him down but i can't remember where they killed him or not i don't know maybe he did didn't die and that's just a false memory i'm having i might have to watch that movie again Here's the official synopsis. Deep within the Hundred Acre Wood, a destructive rage grows as Winnie the Pooh, Piglet, Owl, and Tigger find their home and their lives endangered after Christopher Robin revealed their existence. Not wanting to live in the shadows any longer, the group decides to take the fight to the town of Ashdown, home of Christopher Robin, leaving a bloody trail of death and mayhem in their wake. Winnie and his savage friends will show everyone that they are deadlier, stronger, and smarter than anyone could ever imagine and get their revenge on Christopher Robin once and for all. I swear Christopher Robin is turning into like a real fucking final boy in these films. I do like that. I like that, you know. Um, That's pretty much the gist of like a lot of the... Um, story um, does talk about the cast. So the cast, I, they got a different um, Christopher Robin and they got a different Pooh in this movie. So there is going to be like a young Winnie the Pooh character that's going to be in this film. Yeah, they got a different guy playing um, Christopher Robin. They got a different guy playing Winnie the Pooh, which I'm kind of upset about. But I mean, at the end of the day, the character could be like very um, rotational, like with people playing um, Pooh Bear. Now, I, I feel like the guy that played Christopher Robin, they should have kept kept him in the film, but I'm pretty sure because they are going bigger, better with this film, there's going to be a lot of like, you know, money that they could throw at people to be in this film. But anyway, my thoughts. So my thoughts on this, this is going to be a bigger movie, bigger expectation, just because of like it being a sequel there's going to be a lot more expectations people will have for this film. And especially after the trailer dropped. And if you have not seen the trailer, you should really check it out. But there's a lot of hype. I feel like a little bit with this film because it's shot a lot better. The color corrections is a lot more cleaner than the first film. The practical effects is a lot bigger, better. The costume design is bigger, better. I mean, if you guys look at the way Tigger looks in this fucking film, like you probably don't even have to look at the trailer. Just look at the fucking movie poster. A lot of those characters are very nightmare fueled. I swear, I'm just, I myself was just like, if I were to see these motherfuckers in real life, I will be scared shitless, <laughs> like honestly. So I do like the fact that there's a lot of more money being put into this film. I mean, and it's like, what do you expect? I mean, the first movie, like I mentioned earlier, 100K budget made waves because of the whole public domain. I mean, you got to think a little bit on Disney's part of not wanting to pick up Winnie the Pooh anymore as a whatchamacallit copyrighted project but now it's like a a character that's now hitting the public domain for now anybody to use if none of us knew about this and if this wasn't put as such a big deal I don't think any of us would have known this movie w was going to exist or just even like I feel like this movie wouldn't even exist if Disney just like kept the copyright on Winnie the Pooh. But the movie made waves, made six million dollars. That that is a, a heist right there. That is a good takeaway from just like making a very low budget movie, a low budget indie movie at that. So my thing is, is like I mentioned before, bigger budget, bigger expectation so with that being said, I feel like for this movie to be successful, put like maybe like their budget is speculated at 
500k right now so according to like some news reports they're saying like the budget is like five times the first one so you know simple math 500k i'm thinking because of the success of the first movie the expectation have to be at least 12 million honestly because you want to kind of make more money off of what you did with the project that you did last time and i feel like if jagged edge productions wants to feel like they're getting their money back in some sort of way this movie gotta do about 12 they gotta hit the 12 mil market and i mean and this is going back to what i'm saying before like you know because of this expectation is the movie going to be good i mean the first question that i thought about when i was thinking about this film you know could a bigger budget take away from the novelty of this film the thing is like the novelty that we all know about this film is that it's winnie the pooh we don't really see winnie the pooh going crazy like that just like how there's going to be a steamboat willy film that's going to come i almost forgot that motherfucker's name <laughs> you know I, I was about to call him steamboat mickey mouse or some shit like that <laughs> you know the thing is like we want to know if is the novelty of knowing that you know we know now it's a winnie the pooh movie you know and it's no mystery on what is going to happen in this film now i do like the fact that again the practical effects is a lot better i mean you see this one part where winnie the pooh he throws like this chain and what have you and he snatches a uh, a chick's fucking head off with it and the way the head flies is like really fucking crazy i mean it's almost on terrifier levels in a way i mean not to say that you know this movie is going to be on the same level as terrifier but if this movie ends up being a success i feel like it could jump into being in that next realm uh, honestly and it will probably be like one of the first films horror films actually where there's a lovable mascot that's now a horror mascot <laughs> in a way but I'm kind of I'm kind of treading off a bit on the main point, but could this film lose its novelty because we already know? Um, that's a good question. I mean, and in a way, it has to go back to like how much do we know about this film, and what kind of surprises could this film bring? What interest can this movie draw? I mean, now that we've seen the first Blood and Honey movie. I feel like it's going to be a little difficult to draw people in, especially for like movies that are very, you know, that have that kind of novelty feeling. Like I mentioned before, you know, it's a novelty movie of Winnie the Pooh in a horror movie. Now, I think the biggest novelty of this film is Tigger. So like Tigger wasn't in the last film. And I know a lot of people love fucking Tigger. I mean, it's like the guy is like everyone's life of the party. You know, the guy you want to invite at a party, the guy you want to hang out with at a ball game, whatever, whatever. I think because of Tigger now being in the public domain and now is going to be in this movie, I think that is going to draw enough interest because people want to see what kind of shit is Tigger going to pull in this film? That was one thing that I was thinking about. And another thing that um, that came to mind is. Will this movie outshine the original with the fans? Now, looking at the trailer, I feel like it's well enough on its way. But as y'all know, sometimes trailers are deceiving and sometimes like a film looks good as a trailer but when you actually see it in theaters it ends up not 
translating that well or ends up being like good at all. So the trailer looks good to me. I feel like because of the trailer, there, there, there is going to draw enough interest, especially for like, you know, if they're trying to get box office numbers. Now, I don't know how they would do in box office or get some box office success, but I feel like with just the interest of Tigger and just like the fan base, well, the people that did love Blood and Honey, because there was a lot of people I've heard that didn't like Blood and Honey. And that's another thing is like, is are there an, well is there enough interest for people to want to go see the sequel because there's a lot of people that didn't really like the first film i'm i'm one of the people that loved it honestly and it's because i love films i love slasher films i mean that's my main love i love slasher films i like the low budget ones because the low budget ones do the most <laughs> they do the most I mean, it's like they 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 do a lot of drugs, sex, breasts, titties, <laughs> things that I love, and and definitely a lot of violence and gore. So, for me, you know, I'm a simple man, and my intentions is good. So please don't have me misunderstood. So, I'm a big slasher fan. That um, you know, for me, seeing Winnie the Pooh have all the things that I like, well, minus the drugs. I mean, there was some, some drugs, I mean, with that one character, but it, it was enough to draw my interest and have me excited. Was the story trash? Yes, the story was trash. I do not watch movies like, like Winnie the Pooh for the story. I watch it mainly for the violence and the, in the tits. That's about it. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like, it's like watching Slumber Party Massacre and talking about like, ooh, I want to watch it for the story. Like, no, dude, you want to watch it because there's a bunch of girls in, in nightgowns and possibly some titties coming out. So you want to see them get hacked up by a dude who's running around with a drill, you know, trying to take these, these women out for whatever fucking reason. But yeah, like, that's the only reason why you watch movies like that. You know, you don't watch it for for that whole deep connection and deep understanding of life and all the intricacies that you could get from it. It's like, no, nigga, like the fuck <laughs> we watch. We watch Blood and Honey because a stupid hour and a half unadulterated violence. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's about it. But anyway. That's my thoughts about Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. That should be coming out soon. I can't remember when they said this is coming out. I think they said like either this month or next month. I don't fucking remember. But anyway, moving on. Boat can leave now. Tell the crew. Since we are talking about IPs becoming in public domain or coming to the public domain, I just saw a report um, some time ago. And it was about fucking Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Apparently, Goldilocks and the Three Bears are now in the public domain. I I would assume they probably was in the public domain for some years now. But, I mean, apparently they are now in the public domain. And someone is making a Goldilocks film titled Goldilocks and the Three Bears Blood and Porch. Like, honestly... Can you say biggest fucking ripoffs? I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's like the ripoffs are coming. The ripoffs are coming. This is almost like the cocaine bear incident. But anyway, I'm going to read you guys the Blade Disgusting article that I saw. So, Winnie the Pooh, Cinderella, Mickey Mouse. If a beloved character falls into the public domain, you can be assured that 
a horror movie twist on the classic tale won't be far away. The next of these public domain horrors is a slasher movie, Goldie Locks in the Three Bears, Death and Porridge. And Variety shares a first look sneak peek today. Find it above. So basically, they got a picture of a dude in a Kanye West bear helmet. <laughs> actually, this dude is actually dressed like college dropout Kanye West. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys are Kanye West fans. I did not want to spend this podcast talking about Kanye West and my, how should I put this, disgust by this man lately. Um, If you know me on my personal life, I mean, you would know, like, I'm the biggest Kanye fan. I've been, like, the biggest Kanye supporter. Um, When he was going crazy and doing all the crazy shit. I've been one of those people who could always separate the art from the artist because just because someone is a bit crazy or they say crazy, illogical things that don't align with your beliefs and what have you doesn't make them a person that you should totally follow personally. But if they make great music, I mean, as long as they're not putting their beliefs in their music. It, it, it's, it's Gucci. Like, if they make music that's, like, relatable, fun, whatever, I mean, you could separate the art from the arts. And for the most part, Kanye has always been separating his art from his real life. For the most part, I mean, be, I want to say, like, after Dark Twisted Fantasies, it just became keeping up with Kanye and Kim when they were married, honestly. It was always like a Kim Ye update on his albums and what have you but I've been one to kind of like separate the art from the artist and just like not taking Kanye that that serious or just like looking at him and like you know the man has like a mental health disorder that is very prevalent and it shows so much in his interviews and when he's talking to people now, I get like sometimes he is trolling the paparazzi or just trolling people who interview him for the most part. I mean, I know that's for sure because there are times where he does say outrageous things and people are thinking like, oh my God, Kanye said this, Kanye said that, but it's like some of the things he say is on point, but there are times where he's just like fucking trolling people just so He could stay in the limelight and people have something to talk about. Nowadays, because of the whole um, anti-Semitic talk and rhetoric that he's been putting out there, him talking about that Hitler was right to a certain point or all the way right or whatever he said about Hitler. I mean, he is like a Hitler supporter. That really got to the point where I'm just like, okay, I don't give a fuck that he was praising Trump. I mean, I'm let's be honest. Anybody that's in Hollywood or just like a musician or whatever, as much as they like to play that rhetoric of, oh, we don't support Trump, blah, 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 this, that, and the other, half of the motherfuckers do. And it's because they don't live the same life as you and I. We are nine to five people i mean if we yeah we're all nine to five people i'm gonna just keep it at that i mean whether it's part-time full-time i mean like at the end of the day we're all like on that nine to five grind we're not millionaires we're not even like breaking 100k some of us like that but yeah we're we're we are not in that social scene where Donald Trump is associating with us. Now, a lot of those celebrities, they are in that social scene. So for them, they will support Trump because Trump speaks the same language as them. So I'm not surprised that Kanye or Lil Wayne are in support of Donald Trump because Donald Trump literally speaks the same language as they do. So I didn't really care too much about the Trump. The Trump thing was a bit bothersome, but the whole anti-Semitism and just him saying all that crazy shit about 
Jewish people that I think that's where it like draw the major line to me because after that it's just like he's spreading racial hate going back to the Goldilocks movie so you see like this guy he's in like a fucking college dropout Kanye West costume and you see like this chick um wearing like I don't know what how to describe it but it's kind of like a knockoff um the strangers-esque mask and she's holding a gun to some woman's head so um moving on with the article the upcoming slasher is be is being compared to the strangers and the purge which is obviously what you will see from this picture Variety details in this adaptation of the fairy tale, Goldilocks and the three bears live together in an isolated house in the woods. Now, that's a weird concept that they did. I mean, the bears are living with Goldilocks or Goldilocks is living with the bears. I don't know. I don't think that's what happened in the actual story. But I mean, hey, whatever. This is a horror movie at the end of the day. When a group of friends enter their home, Goldilocks leader of the bears pack decides to get rid of the intruders craig Rees also did antebellum and whispers directed for Rees dragon productions Rees olga solo abigail huxley and julianne amos star no word yet on a u.s release for this one stay tuned the box office success of wing the pooh blood and honey last year is to blame for this current trend of public domain inspired horror movies with a sequel on the way this year all right so that's the story for winnie the oh no i'm sorry i was about to call this winnie the pooh but the story of goldilocks and the three bears death and porridge i don't know why they, i don't know why i put blood and porridge or said blood and porridge on the notes but <laughs> I, as you can see i'm still thinking about winnie the pooh in some way or fashion but i also came across as you you were hearing in the story cinderella's curse so i saw an article on horror press the cinderella movie is coming so according to horror press when i saw the news they're calling this movie cinderella's curse and they have an actual trailer for this movie so um i'm gonna read you guys the article and i am going to give you guys my reaction to cinderella's curse so a while back we caught wind of a cinderella horror movie on the horizon louisa warren directs this twist on the fairy tale entitled cinderella's curse which stars kelly rian sanson as cinderella Lately, no childhood classic is saved. It definitely is it <laughs> from a horror treatment. I have been living for it. Mickey's Mouse Trap, which is another Mickey Mouse film that's supposed to be coming out, but um, I think this one is facing some troubles because they're actually using the name Mickey Mouse now. Um, as if anyone knows about IPs, um, there's certain words characters that you could use for the mickey mouse situation steamboat willie is the only thing that's really available so steamboat steamboat willie's name likeness imagery you could use for whatever because that's in the public domain what you cannot use from what i'm hearing i i can't remember where i saw this but what you cannot use is the the moniker mickey mouse so i know right now the mickey's mouse trap movie that one is facing kind of like a little bit of purgatory or just like a little bit of trouble so i think if that one does get released i mean they might see a lawsuit <laughs> if they release that film but moving on mickey's mouse trap winnie the pooh blood and honey 2 and peter pan's neverland nightmare which sounds like a Michael Jackson documentary, but um, oop, let me not go there, are just a few of the horror reimaginings of childhood favorites on the way. Since the announcement of Cinderella's Curse, I've been craving to see how it will interpret the classic fairy tale. 
After all, the original stories of Cinderella are not without their morbidities that leave a horror director a lot to play with. The trailer for Cinderella's Curse is here and I am happy to report that the movie is everything I was hoping for and more. Alright, so I'm going to play the... I'm going to try to get this as close to the mic as possible and I am going to play the trailer and you guys will get my live reaction. I actually looked at this earlier and I just want to give you guys a reaction to it. All right, so we starting off with the high shot. What the fuck did they just put in her plate? All right, for some of you guys that aren't, for you guys that won't be seeing my, well, seeing the actual video of this, um, because I'm just doing audio, but um, so they have like this dinner party and. I guess the stepsisters give Cinderella a plate of whatever. And in that plate, it just looks like a bunch of guts and what have you on the plate. So, yeah, she starts screaming and shit. So. All right. Prince Charming just came in. Oh, 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 and he spit in her face. Mad disrespectful. Oh, and she just got slapped too. Oh, what the fuck is that? All right, so right now Cinderella's curse is turning into a lot of Carrie. So when I was looking at this trailer earlier, I was like, okay, they really are taking a lot from Carrie. Yeah, actually, it is. It's like it's literally Cinderella meets fucking Carrie. Like this, like you might as well just fucking watch Carrie. But I mean, if you want to see low budgeted films. I, I don't hate anybody that wants to watch low low budget films. I mean, if if anything, if this hits like Tubi or something, which it should hit Tubi, by the way. Um, I am definitely going to watch it. Honestly, I mean, I'm, if I want to be for it with y'all, I mean, y'all know I love my bootleg horror movies, so this one I will definitely watch if it hits streaming. I'm not paying for this shit. <laughs> Oh, she got the glass slipper. Oh, and she just stabbed somebody. Run, bitch, run! Hello, Hannah. Oh, and she about to clip some toes with some scissors. Oh, shit. You know what? I do like the fact that they, they have... Cinderella cutting the toes of one of her stepsisters. All right, I think it's supposed to be your stepsisters because that was in the actual grim fairy tale. <laughs> All right. So there's more to the story. In the trailer, we see a disregarded Cinderella invited to the ball by Prince Charming alongside her stepsisters. Oh, by the way, I will um, link the trailer for you guys. So definitely it'll be in the bio. So for if y'all want to check out the trailer of this movie, if you haven't checked it out yet, the link will be there. But anyway, the night of the ball, things go wrong for Cinderella. I screamed when Prince Charming spit directly in her face. Oh, man. I, I tripped out, too. I was like, damn. Disrespectful. I mean, this man literally spit in this girl's eye. He's like, mm, bitch. <laughs> I, I swear, like, I, I've lost my shit. <laughs> then we see a ghastly trio with gore, 
gore for faces offering cinderella three wishes fun fact in the original cinderella stories there was no fairy godmother the concept of the fairy godmother was added by charles perrault in 1697 more than a century before the grim brothers grim adaptation after cinderella wishes for revenge the trailer treats us to a carrie-esque scene at the ball with fast shots of the ensuing chaos, including Cinderella wielding the famous glass slipper as a weapon. Speaking of the glass slipper, the moment we saw Cinderella give her stepsister's toe the old heave-ho with a pair of scissors, I recognized the nod to the Brothers Grimm version of Cinderella where the stepsisters hack off pieces of their feet to fit into the glass slipper. As the trailer ends with Cinderella mashing the shoe onto her stepsister's mangled foot and saying it fits, I had such a triumphant feeling of glee. This is the version of Cinderella I've always wanted to see, and I'm so looking forward to it. I wonder what her other wishes will be. And I think that's the only reason to want to see this movie is to see the other wishes. But this movie is coming to theaters. This is what the article says. Cinderella's Curse will be released in theaters April 4th, 2024. Um, all right. So after reading those two articles, I have a few thoughts. So first thoughts is because of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey being so successful as it was in theaters. Is this going to be the current trend we are looking forward to for the next three to five years? This this was my thought about like when I heard about Goldie Locks and and the three bears coming out. I was like, okay, now I know they are really on a trim. I have not seen the Peter Pan movie. I don't know if the Peter Pan movie already came out or not. But I remember hearing about Peter Pan. I know for sure I heard about this Cinderella film before I heard about the Goldie Locks film. But to see that, like, they already have a trailer for this movie. And honestly, the trailer is basically the movie. I mean, they give up everything. I mean, there's nothing that I want to say is a surprise, unlike Winnie the Pooh, which is much more of a surprise than than this film. But because of Cinderella and now Goldilocks and the Three Bears, is this going to be a trend we see coming in the next three to five years? We've seen this trend before, and it was there were successful trends and there were not successful trends. So, I mean, trends I could think of are like the, the trends when Scream came out. So when Scream came out, we had like a big slasher resurgence, not only just like with slashers, but like meta horror as well. So you have movies like I Know What You Did Last Summer, Urban Legend, Bride of Chucky had his thing with the meta humor. Um, a resurgence of slashers because, well, old school slashers, we see Halloween H2O comes out. And I feel like Halloween H2O was probably like one of the start of like the reboot series that we see later on that is prevalent to today. Um, we also had Scary Movies, which was a parody, but also with its own meta humor and also the faculty and a few other films that. I've never seen it seen before, but they are just like on the same parameters as Scream of, of that trend. I want to say during that time, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people were probably like loving that trend. I mean, if you were a teen, which I was a teen, I love that trend with with Scream and everything. I I love the trend that like there was a lot. I mean, I didn't really recognize at recognize it as a trend, but I knew like they were direct ripoffs or copycats of scream so when scream came out you know at birth i know what you did last summer which was exciting to look at urban legend definitely a very forgettable movie i'm not even gonna lie to y'all i seen urban legend before but i saw it years ago and it's very forgettable it's not one of those horror movies that really stick with you um, the faculty, I really do love the faculty. I, I mainly wanted to see the faculty because Usher was in it. And I was a big Usher fan as a kid. So I wanted to see him in the movie and see what he was going to do. 
and how his role was going to be in that film. Scary Movies was like a classic for everyone. But I mean, after that, you know, years later, like not too far in the 2000s, like around 2004, I believe, or five, you get Saw. And Saw birthed the craze of torture porn. So after Saw came out, there was definitely a lot of copycats that came out. You get Hostel, Escape Room, Die, Would You Rather, The Collector. And these are movies that I've seen. I'm not listing any movies that I haven't seen that that were on the craze because if you know I didn't watch them. <laughs> but um yeah, you, you had a lot of like the torture porn, you know, they they were doing their thing. Um, but none of them were exceptionally better than Saw. Same thing with the J Horror remix. I think I hated this trend the most. I really hated the J Horror remix. The only thing that was good about that time was The Ring. The Ring was the only movie that was really good. I I myself did not know a lot of these movies like The Ring, The Grudge were all like remakes from Japanese horrors. And and hearing that those Japanese horror movies were better than the Americanized movies made me want to watch those more. I mean, I haven't seen Ringu. I know it's all over streaming right now, but I still haven't had a chance to watch those movies, but I have seen the Juon movies and I I tell you right now, I love the Japanese version of those movies better than the Americanized grudge movies. Those movies are ass, honestly. Um but moving forward, I mean you get more trends of the Conjuring universe, you know, the like the Conjuring universe obsession was a trend within itself. And we're still getting Conjuring fucking movies coming out. <laughs> I mean, it's like fucking Marvel movies. I mean, even the Marvel movies, superhero movies, those were a big trend as well. And I know a lot of people, they are, they are getting fatigue from those films. So I feel like, you know, like these trends, they're, they're not, they're not anything new. They're not anything new at all. Um, we've seen a lot of this before. I mean, and unfortunately, we're going to get a lot more horror movies. I mean, as long, I mean, as soon as IPs are like going into public domains, we're going to see a lot more films become satirized into a horror film. So I'm not I'm not too excited about this trend right now because. I feel like there could only be one good horror movie that's doing this. And I feel like it's just the people that are working on the Winnie the Pooh movie. Unless, you know, we unless Blood and Honey 2 ends up being super ass. The next thing that I was thinking about with this whole situation is, is this going to be in theaters? As we learned just now, Cinderella's Curse is apparently going to theaters. I feel like this should not be a movie that should go into theaters this should actually be fit for streaming like this should be on a streaming site like i mentioned earlier to be and maybe to a to a lesser extent i mean it it have to be on a free channel it can't be on anything you have to pay for it unless it's like fucking shutter or screen box after that it's like this movie shouldn't even be in theaters. Why is Cinderella's Curse in theaters? And it's like, it's not going to make a lot, honestly. It's too risky. It's too risky. It's too much of a knockoff. I, I don't know. Unless peop, unless I'm wrong, I feel like I could be wrong. People maybe are a little excited to see Cinderella in some sort of way in a horror film. But what about Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Now, that movie, I feel for sure, should definitely hit streaming services as well. I mean, I don't know if you guys remember when Cocaine Bear came out. Um, I did an episode of talking about Cocaine Bear. And 
after Cocaine Bear dropped and it was a big success last year, there were a lot of knockoffs trying to come out afterwards. One of those knockoffs that I saw were Cocaine Shark. And if you guys don't remember what I said about Cocaine Shark, basically, Cocaine Shark was the epitome of B horror movie ripoffs that looked just god awful and was just too weird to even be a movie that should be even like remotely made. I mean, I feel like some of these movies, as uh, Jay Z will put it, probably shouldn't even be made, you know? And this is how I know they already worked on it because they had a trailer and the trailer looked god awful. Fortunately, the movie never hit theaters, or at least I, to my knowledge, it never hit theaters. There never was a big announcement about it being in theaters. Now, one day I was on Tubi just looking through the horror section, and guess what I found? Fucking Cocaine Shark, bro. Just sitting there in all its, like, fucking glory, saying fucking movie poster that i saw on blade disgusting with the shark just like coming out like jaws but cocaine all over the place so i'm definitely going to give that movie a watch sometime soon and i might come back with an episode talking about like what the fuck happened (laughs) but yeah cocaine shark is on tubi and as it should be it should be on there Just like with some of the rest of these movies, like fucking Steamboat Willie, Cinderella, fucking Goldilocks, Peter Pan, and whatever the else they want to do, like with these old ass IPs that they want to turn into horror movies, they need to stick these motherfuckers onto Tubi. Honestly speaking, I mean, the only one I really do feel like should be in theories, but even then, I feel like this should be on fucking Tubi as well. It's fucking Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey too. I mean, they really upped their game on that film as far as like what money they put down and how the film is presented. So I feel like that movie is the only movie that should probably really be in theaters. But other than that, I mean, stick that bitch onto Tubi or stick that bitch onto Peacock. You know, <laughs> um, the last thing that I want to talk about is as far as dealing with this topic I feel like there's just too much focus on, and I know this is like the Hollywood focus and everything like that, but I feel like there's too much remakes, reboots, and ripoffs. The 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 three R's, man. The three R's. I sound like a fucking pirate, but the three R's, you know, we, we got to stop with all this bullshit, honestly. Like, I'm tired of seeing so many fucking ripoffs that are just like really fucking terrible honestly and we need to get back to just focusing on original material but i know one thing hollywood does not like to do or just the movie industry in general they don't like to put their focus onto risky films that they feel like won't budget too much now, I'm going to give you guys a list of films on my look, on my research um, of films that were risky films that made a big splash, honestly. Um, number one is Get Out. Get Out was only budgeted at $4.5 million. The box office they, they made from this film is $255 mil. Now... A lot of y'all may may say like, well, Doom, this movie isn't that risky because Jordan Peele is behind the film. But I tell you, it is risky that Jordan Peele was behind this film because if you know anything about Jordan Peele, Jordan Peele is mostly known for comedy. If you were a 90s kid like I was, you would know Jordan Peele from Mad TV, just like being a goofball, making jokes. Um, imitating R. Kelly and whatever weird other characters that he did. The one that stuck out to me most was R. Kelly when he did Trapped in the Closet. That was the funniest one for me. For him to venture from comedy to now into the horror sphere, 
it was definitely very risky. I mean, you know, we know him from Key and Pill. I mean, I mean, I guess that would be like the most famous thing. I mean, I know I'm saying Mad TV, but for a lot of people, they'll probably know him better from Key and Pill. And to see him go from Key and Pill to now writing horror movies and directing them, that's a big step. Like, because the first thing we thought, at least for me, the first thing I thought when Get Out was coming out, I was like, ah, oh, shit, Jordan Peele is making a horror comedy movie. whoop de doo You know, I was not excited to hear that Jordan Peele got a horror movie out because I felt like it was going to be a comedy you know, and and not to mention, like, I mean, Jordan Peele is funny to a certain extent to me, but uh, I'm not really, like, into his comedy that much. I mean, if I wanted to hear black-white comedy, I'll listen to fucking Donald Glover. I mean, that's, that's just to be honest, honestly, but after seeing Get Out and hearing all the craze about it, I went to the theaters and I actually watched this movie in theaters. Um, if you guys know, I'm not a big theater person just because I don't fuck with the prices like that. And just the whole atmosphere sometimes it, it is a bit annoyance for me. Um, just dealing with like people. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of people most of the time. <laughs> but um to see this movie in theaters and to see that it was given like an actual horror treatment and it was produced the way it was produced. I was amazed. It was one of my top films. It's one of the movies that I feel like is a certified classic on its own, you know, just like after seeing it. I mean, it's like, this is going to be a movie that we're going to be talking about for many years. So Get Out was definitely a movie that was risky, that made a lot of profit. Paranormal Activity was budgeted at 15K. Box office numbers was $193 million. Um, As y'all know, I'm not a big paranormal fan per se. I mean, I do think like, I do love the found footage movies. I love, I love found footage, as y'all know, I love found footage movies, but I'm not a big fan of ghost films because I could feel like, I feel like sometimes they're a little bit too repetitive, um, haunted house films, I mean, uh, I'm kind of shaky on the haunted house part, but, um, and, and, and there is a big difference between, like, haunted house possession and ghost stories, um, like, before anybody that, goes and say like well it's all the same but i i do think like there's a big difference between all of them um just in case we got somebody ignorant listening to this podcast but paranormal i do like some of the paranormal films and actually it's funny because i was why i watched paranormal 2 that's where i started i watched paranormal 2 and paranormal 3 i'm trying to think did i watch paranormal 4 i can't remember if i watched paranormal 4 if I did, I probably don't really remember, but um, I watched Paranormal 2 and 3 first before I saw the first one, and they were interesting. I mean, it was interesting enough. I think I think for me, I hate the fact that there's a lot of, like, dicking around by the ghost throughout the whole entire movie, and it doesn't really pick up until, like, the last 30 minutes of the film where you find out, like, there's like satanic cults and all this shit happening or some type of witches and shit like that is going on. And I think that's what really drew my interest in watching the series itself. Um, but as a series, like, you know, would I put this as a top series? Not really. Like the franchise is all right to me again. Like I, I just don't like the dicking around. Um, Another movie that was low budgeted that makes a big splash in the box office is Saw, my favorite film franchise, as y'all know. Um, That one is 1.2 million and it's Splash, uh, Curry for the Three Splash for 103.9 million. I remember when this movie came out, um, some people didn't fuck with it. I know one of my friends. Um, in college, they did not fuck with this film at all. They were just like, oh my god, this film is getting a fucking 
sequel why is this whack-ass movie getting a sequel when i finally saw it i bought the dvd i didn't see this one in theaters i really wanted to see this movie in theaters but i never got a chance to see seeing it in theaters i think i don't think they had it in theaters for a very long time as well but um i wanted to really see this movie and when i finally got the dvd it was like a big splash for me i was like in love instantly instantly you know because it's a mix of like slasher and detective movies and if y'all don't know i mean i'm into like the film noir type films you know i love movies like fucking mulholland falls chinatown um no country from old man has a bit of like film noir in it as well as western neo western um elements as well so for Saul to have like that bit of like a mix of like detective work, slasher, and just like pure gore in it, I was invested and I was invested heavily into like the following movies. And I mean, Saw 10, bro, I, I can't remember where I put it, but I'm pretty sure it was top five like Dylon. <laughs> Oh man, but um another movie that made a big splash that had a low budget was The Babadook. So Babadook was was budgeted at 1.2 mil, splashed away with 10.5. Not a big splash like all the other films that I've mentioned, but definitely still made a big splash from just a 1.2 million budget. And I mean j- you know, it was a risk, but it was a risk that paid off. And same thing with Blood and Honey. It was a $100,000 made movie that splashed at $6 million. So for me, um, just like closing out this whole argument that I'm having right now, we need to go back to trying to make original content. You know, we need original creators. We need more original movies. Um, I want to say, I want to feel like the movie industry needs to try and push for more and more. I mean, and I get I get it because like they're trying to make their money back somehow, some way. And it and it hurts when you get burned when your movie doesn't make the budget that the theaters well that the companies have put in and you and you feel a bit burned just you know, you put like so many millions into this project just to get a low payout but there are movies that are just undisputedly good honestly and i hate the fact that just because there is familiarity familiar familiar i swear i can't um say that word right now i i get so tongue-tied but um just because you could recognize a name and you're familiar with it doesn't mean like it's always good because i feel like right now we are in a in a trend where like familiar projects are now bombing in the box office honestly and in the superhero craze i i'm hearing is a lot i don't keep up with the superhero movies like that because i mean there's not too many superhero movies i want to watch i don't fuck with the marvel movies just so we're clear everybody (laughs) i know there's gonna be some people that's like well well don't you like the marvel movies oh oh and i mean i'm just saying like the the marvel nut huggers need to shut the fuck up i mean honestly like i'm i'm so tired of hearing people tell me oh how can you not watch the marvel movies they're so old they're on disney plus blah 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 this then the other it's like i don't give a fuck shut up (laughs) Like, damn, I don't give a fuck about these Marvel movies. Like, I'm going to tell you right now, and I know I've mentioned this before, but the only Marvel movies that I've watched were fucking, that's in that universe, I should say. Let, let, let me keep it to that whole, like, Avengers universe, because there are Marvel movies I have watched in the past and present, but the only Marvel movies that I've watched that's in that fucking Avengers universe have been iron man the first one and black panther do i give a fuck that i have not seen endgame hell fucking no i do not give a fuck about endgame y'all 
you know, for anybody that really wants to sit here and be like, well, Endgame is so awesome. I've hear, I've heard it. I've heard it so many times. So many people just hugging Marvel's nuts and kissing them too. Um, I don't give a fuck about Endgame. Like, honestly. And that's just my preference. I mean, it's like, it's, I feel like people can't even have a fucking preference anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure right now, for those that are probably offended, they prefer not to listen to me. And that's fine. But at the end of the day, I, I'm still going to be doing what I'm doing. But I, I don't give a fuck about Marvel, honestly. And I don't really feel like I'm missing out on much, honestly. After they started, like, connecting universes and coming out with several... 1500 movies and all that and people was just jumping on the films to um have like some connections to the universe i was like yeah no nah, i'm not keeping up with this bitch anymore like i missed out on fucking i forget what, what was the next movie that came out came after iron man i think it was iron man 2 and then it was the hulk and i think thor followed afterwards and captain america and all that shit and after hearing like how they were all just jumping on each other's films and everything like that, I was just like, all right, you know what? Y'all fucking lost me. I'm not keeping up with this bullshit. It's too fuck too many fucking movies to watch that I don't have fucking time for, honestly. But that's just me ranting right now, but and I almost forgot about what my point was. But oh yeah, but yeah. Studios need to take more risk. They need to take more risk in properties that are are surefire winners i mean it's just just like stop taking so much putting so much money into trash honestly but i mean you never know what movies will do good and what movies won't do good and i know why they do all these fucking superhero movies because they are all cash grabs for the studios to kind of like make up for whatever money that they lost on whatever risky ip that they put their money into so to to kind of like because i am kind of going almost an hour into this whole um talk (laughs) into this whole little segment (laughs) but to kind of like close out the argument we need more original content but at the end of the day the three r's are not going away you know, we're going to still continue getting remakes, reboots, and ripoffs just so the studios can make their money. It all comes down to the money, man. You know, like Wu-Tang said, cash rules everything around me. Alright, so we are here for the Slasher Corner where I have a Slasher Corner movie of the week. Well, <laughs> not necessarily a slasher, but you know, I always have you guys a movie that you can watch for the week. And the movie that I am choosing is Scream, Blackula Scream. And y'all know I love this film, but um, yeah, this film came out in 1973. This is starring Pam Greer and William Marshall. This is the sequel to the first Blackula movie. Um, directed by Bob Kiljan. Um, apparently this guy, you know, he's known for like directing different TV episodes on Starsky and Hush. He did like about eight episodes. He directed an episode for the Wonder Woman TV show. Um, did, did a episode on Dukes of Hazard and Charlie's Angels. He's also acted in a couple of um, TV roles as well. He did a role on Alfred Hitchcock's Presents and Outer Limits. So the synopsis of this movie is when a tormented vampire Manualdi is revived by a voodoo cult, he takes an interest in a voodoo priestess who may be able to put his soul to rest. Um, Yeah, so I feel like this movie, this movie was more 
on the horror side so um i feel like not enough people talk about this film so definitely check that movie out um that is on tubi i believe so definitely watch that movie and i am gonna go ahead and sign out this has been another episode of let's talk about horror um this is your boy walter doom signing out thank you to you the audience for listening to another episode and have me here in your in your stereo on your computer or wherever you're listening to me whether that's on youtube on the different platforms like spotify apple Podcasts, and yeah i mean if you want to follow me on those socials those social medias are walter doom horror on instagram tiktok and youtube the walter doom on x and walter doom wherever else is involved streaming podcasts so this has been another episode of let's talk about horror this is america don't let them catch you slipping out stay diabolical people peace